Okay, let's take our Bibles and let's turn together in uh, the book of Genesis. We're going to be looking at particularly chapter 12, verses 10 through 20. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 20, we've been looking at the life of Abram. And there are so many lessons. The, the subject of this series is that of strengthening our faith. Today we're going to be looking at an example when he didn't display that kind of faith. It's, um, it's a blot upon his record of his life. And I think you're going to see that immediately as we begin to look at this passage. Uh, but let's look at this portion. They, Abram has moved his family into Canaan. And as they have come into this brand new land, it's, they, there is nothing about this that is familiar at all. And so they're, they're going and they don't have any home. So they're going from place to place to place and living. And we come in chapter 12, at verse 10, you follow along in your Bible as I read it. It says, Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, Look, I know that you're beautiful, the, that, what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but let you live. Please say you're my sister, so that it will go well for me because of you. And my life will be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh so that the woman was taken into Pharaoh's household. He treated Abram well because of her, and Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, and male and female slaves and camels. But God struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her as my wife? Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. The enemy of faith is fear. And when we have something collide into our world that we can't fix or change or overcome, or, or no, so there's so many unknowns out there, or heal, we tend to resort to fear. That's our first reaction. We panic because of these matters that collide into our world. And so triumphing over what we'll call sinful fear, okay? What we'll call sinful fear is part of the learning curve of the Christian life because it's, it's a whole lifetime. I struggle, don't you, with these things? And it's like a default setting. We struggle with fear when these things come into our lives and, and we can't change them. And if our pattern is anything like the disciples of Jesus, then we stumble and then we get up and then we stumble again and in these, these moments, we act a, a lot like them. I mean, what did they do after all the time they had been with him when he was arrested? What did they do? They fled in terror into the night and left him alone. 
And this is the disciples of Jesus. Jesus had told his followers repeatedly things like this. Do not fear. Do not be anxious. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he would add things like, where is your faith? And take courage. Or nothing is impossible with God. Or believe in God, believe also in me. And then we read verses that we love so well from the Old Testament, such as that which was spoken to the people of Israel when the prophet Isaiah looked ahead to Cyrus when he would be, you know, he hadn't been born yet, but um, years ahead, what would take place. And he told, he, he told the people of Israel, someday you're going to be in exile, but these are the words that God had. He said, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. To Joshua, before he took the people and led the people of Israel into the promised land, God infused him with confidence. Similar words. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's twice that the, the scriptures emphasize that I am with you. That, that should make all the difference in the world. You're not alone. I am with you, and that seems to evaporate fear. When the disciples were on that stormy sea, it was Jesus who was with them in the boat. And he says, where is your faith? Likewise, in the early church, when Peter and John were arrested and the church went to prayer, uh, and, and after they prayed, the house was shaken as though the Holy Spirit wanted to say, hey, I'm with you in this. You're not alone. Be bold in your witness for, of the gospel. And so we, we read these verses, and, and some of them we even memorize. But again, the setting that we go back to again and again, is that a fear? That was what was going on with, with Abram. He was dealing with fear. Now, the Bible warns us about what I call sinful fear. Not every fear is sinful. I mean, we train our children that there is a proper and, and a, an expected fear. You don't just walk out there and do something foolish. So not every fear is sinful. And in fact, some fears need to be treated by a doctor. But we're talking about a, a fear similar to what we see in Abram and so many other places throughout the Bible where a crisis slams into a person's life and they begin to panic. And that kind of fear is unworthy of our Father in heaven who assures us with that word picture that says, you are under my wings. I'm taking care of you and you are with me. Genesis 12, 10 explains the crisis that, that started this fear, and that is there was a famine in the land. And Abram and his family had just newly arrived. They didn't own anything except what they brought with them. They were homeless, and this was about survival. We've got to get through this so that we understand what that's like when we're stripped of our resources and, you know, plan B dries up and so does plan C and D and we go into this survival mode and we begin to focus upon the problem and our options. And how am I going to get through this? And he must have asked the similar questions. How am I going to get through this? What is going to be the future of me? And, and what if I can't fix this? Where do, we, where do we go from here? And that's where we find Abram today. Abram's like a lot of us. He's dealing with fear. He doesn't know what to do. And, and he panics. 
And he's thinking, I got to survive this. Now, I wish that I could say that Abram provides a really good example of how to deal with fear, but he doesn't. He falls on his face here. And this is a man that is, is, uh, is a great man of faith, and yet it's not here. He panicked, and the decisions that he made put in jeopardy dozens and dozens of people. And as a result of that, it was a great peril. Everything about this story is like a case study in what not to do. But, but I believe that there are things that we can learn from this man. First of all, we've got to learn how to avoid creating the buzz saw that he created. And we've got to learn about the remedy of fear. And so we're going to be looking at that today. Famine was probably something that Abram was not familiar with in his own personal experience. And that is probably because um, he, didn't, he, he grew up in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is at the, the meeting point of the Euphrates and the Tigris. And so it was a very fertile land. That he, and he, that's where he was born and raised. They didn't have famine in the area where he grew up. And then he had been living in Haran for some years, and that was part of the Fertile Crescent. So this was probably his first experience of dealing with a real famine. In verse 9, backing up, it tells us that Abram came to Canaan, and then by stages he moved south to the Negev. Now that's important, because what it tells us that the Negev itself is a word that, that means, in its root word, dry or parched. So the area that he moved into, farming was limited. And, um, and supplies were limited. And he had vast herds and, and livestock. And it was the kind of land that being dry and parched, if there was a famine, well, how are you going to survive? It's, it's nearly impossible to keep li livestock alive. It was an unforgiving land. You, you couldn't afford to make a mistake if you're living in the Negev. And so verse 10 says that he moved down to Egypt, where, of course, being in the delta there where the Nile is, there was a lot of fertile land. And he could take his livestock and his family, and there was grain, and green pastures, and there they were going to live until the famine was done. But it just wasn't quite that simple. He was dealing with at least two kinds of fear. The first fear was the fear of the unknown. Worry and anxiety must have kept him up at night as he was thinking about, what about the future? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to keep my business? Because he was in the farming, the livestock business. How am I going to keep this afloat? What am I going to do? How am I just going to live? You can get an ulcer thinking about that. You can get an ulcer trying to work through all of the what ifs. And what if that could go on forever. There's always a what if out there that terrifies us. Now, Jesus knew that this was very common for us to go down this road of the fear of the unknown. And that's why he uh, assured us in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, 25, he says, Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. <laughs> he said, all that worrying, can that add even a single hour to your life? Well, of course it can. He says, your heavenly Father knows what you need. And so he tries to calm us down. But, you know, we're back to, you know, all of the what ifs. And they crowd into our mind. Well, what if, what if I can't pay my bills? What if my resources dry up and what's going to happen to me tomorrow? And what if, what if, what if? It's the fear of the unknown. But there's a second fear here. 
And that is the fear of people. Fear of man, we could call it. And Genesis 12, 12 11 through 13. Let me read it one more time. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, Look, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but let you live. Please say you're my sister, so that it will go well for me because of you. And my life will be spared on your account. This describes the fear of people, the fear of man. Abram was afraid of real or imagined, you know, it was this threat of people that they were going to kill him and steal his wife. Uh, maybe things like that did happen. But he's got it all figured out in his mind, and so he reasons to himself and says, well, if they think that Sarai is my sister, well, then they won't go after me to harm me, because I'm just her brother. And so he says, would you? You know, not the would you, but do it. Tell them that you're my sister. And this fear of man drove him to do something very foolish because he put his wife in danger. And then this spilled over and affected the household of Pharaoh and then ended up just trashing Abram's reputation. He walks out of Egypt humiliated because of this and the way he's thinking this through. Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. It was the fear of people that drove Peter to deny Jesus, wasn't it? It was a little maid girl comes up to him and questions him, and he just like freezes. Paralysis sets in. And he says, I don't even know the man. And did this three times. Fear of people, it, the proverb says, is like a trap. It's a snare that grabs our feet and trips us up. And we stumble into this pit because of this panic that we're in. And we end up doing things that are very foolish as a result of this fear of people. It distracts us so that instead of walking boldly in the will and in the plan of God, we reason to ourselves and get everything messed up because of the fear of man. Because Abram was afraid of man, he, he showed a level of disrespect to his wife that just, is just alarming to me. They will kill me. Please say you're my sister so that it will go well for me. You know, and my life will be spared. Talk about self-absorbed and self-serving and, and this self-preservation at her expense. He was using her so that he could live, at least, you know, in his imagination. And we got to ask ourselves, well, Abram, what about the danger? And what about the abuse that you're showing your own wife because of this deception? Well, what are these abuses? Well, first of all, it's the abuse of um, a violation of her own conscience. She was lying. And that technically was a half lie because they did share the same father but had different mothers. But it's a technicality. Is that okay if you can tell half a truth on a technicality? What do you think? Would you recommend that to your kids? If it's a technicality, it's okay. No, no. Hey, it's not the truth. So on a technicality. But it violated her conscience. That's not right. A husband to do that to his wife and put her in that kind of situation. And then there was the danger of becoming another man's wife. And of course... There's the follow-up danger of being forced into physical relations with that man who is not her real husband. And Abram's fear of people 
led him to sin against his wife and really to sin against Pharaoh and certainly to sin against God. And it was abusive at its core because I think it boils down to saying, well, Sarai, you put yourself in danger so that I might be spared danger. Is that okay? I don't think so. Our fear of the unknown and our fear of people, it just messes with us so that we don't think properly. We make bad decisions. Our reasoning gets messed up. We're not using good wisdom. We make foolish decisions and we react in panic and sinful fear can boomerang and it can end up hurting others and hurting ourselves. Well, we go on and we see that Pharaoh's household was not left unscathed here. Verses 14 through 17. Let me read that again. You follow along. It says, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And she's 65 here, by the way. She's got it. But if she's got, she's got it. And he says, you know, you still look like a young woman here. You're beautiful. And they greed. Man, she's a knockout. And so they, you know, word gets around, doesn't it? You know, what a beautiful lady she is. And verse 15, Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh so that the woman was taken to Pharaoh's household. And then he, the, good, look at this. He treated Abram well because of her. And this guy's not saying a thing. Okay, what's he take? Well, thank you very much for the flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, uh, male and female slaves, and of course, you're going to throw in some camels there, which is like a Mercedes Benz or something like that, you know. A really top drawer vehicle. Threw in some camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Now, Abram was right about that, that his wife was attractive and it gained the notice of other men. And, uh, but Pharaoh acted in good faith. He really believed that this woman was Abram's single sister and that she is available to be my wife, Pharaoh is saying to himself. And because of the fear and the lie that, uh, that Abram was uh, caught up in here, an innocent party suffered. Pharaoh and his whole household suffered as a result of it. It's like collateral damage in all of this. Because God intervened. He was not going to be putting up with this nonsense. And so the Lord intervened to stop it. This is not going on anymore. And as a result of Abram's lie, the Lord was forced to do something to end it. There's a lot of nonsense going on here. And Pharaoh's house suffered as a result of Abram's sin. Now, the force of the word in verse 17, which is, is a very strong force that says the Lord struck Pharaoh, literally means to strike with strokes, meaning that we could say it in our own vernacular that, that uh, God hammered Pharaoh, I mean, with many blows, hammered that whole household, and it didn't take a genius to understand that Almighty God was not happy. So, no wonder Pharaoh called Abram to have a straight, honest talk with him and said, well, how could you treat me this way? Here you are a guest in my country and enjoying all the benefits of the land and all these gifts I gave you, and you repay me by lying to me? And this is your wife. I brought her into my household as my wife. How could you do this to me? What do we say about this? And where do we stand with regard to fear? Fear of people, fear of the unknown, 
And where does it take us? Maybe you're dealing with that today. And I would caution you, as I caution myself, don't allow fear of the unknown or the fear of people to lead to this, this sinful fear that will result in foolishness and will bring about real regret as a result. Now, what do we say about this? Well, the first thing we say is that nobody came out ahead from this account. This was a wasteland of damage when fear controlled the situation. And when sinful fear controls us, we don't think properly. That's another thing we can take away from here. We don't reason well. Wisdom seems to escape us, and we make foolish decisions. And, and then another observation is there are times where God is forced to intervene and put a stop to the nonsense. And when he does so, there, there can be the collateral damage as a result. And other people around us, loved ones, and people that we may not even know are affected by the foolishness that we put ourselves into. And then another observation would be that Abram forgot the God of glory, the one who revealed himself to him when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans. It's Stephen's sermon in, in uh, Acts 12, uh, 7 that brings this out, the force of this to say, it was the God of glory that appeared to Abram and motivated him to leave the Ur of the Chaldeans. The God of glory met him. He forgot that. The glorious, majestic splendor, transcendence of God. He saw that. And somehow that didn't register at this point. As though, eh, I forgot that. So what's the answer to sinful fear? What is the remedy that we can employ here? Because we want to avoid the, uh, the path that this man went down. We have to avoid, uh, avoid abusing others or violating consciences or sickness that may result. Or He left in deep humiliation as a result of this. Can you imagine picking up all of his stuff in his household and people asking, where are we going? Oh, we got to leave. We're being kicked out. Well, why? Well, Pharaoh kicked me out. Got to leave because I lied. And as a result, deep humiliation. Well, what's the, the remedy to sinful fear? There is one remedy that is guaranteed to work for sinful fear. And it is summarized like this. Delight yourself in the Lord. It's that simple. Delight yourself in the Lord. It changes everything. It changes our perspective. It changes our heart. It changes how we view God and how we view ourselves and put everything in its proper place. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Who is the Lord? He's the covenant-keeping Lord, the promise-keeping Lord, the one who is sufficient for the need and for the hour. It's this Lord that we're taking delight in. And when we delight in the Lord, we're also delighting in Jesus Christ, who is the I Am. How many times in the book of John do we see where Jesus reinforces the fact that he himself is Yahweh. That's me, the same one who appeared before Moses in the burning bush. I'm the same one. I'm the one that was there. When the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and they were going across at nighttime by themselves and Jesus appeared out of nowhere walking and they were panicking and he calls out, and the, the simple word is, I am. You know, I'm, I'm here, but it's just, I am. And then how many times did he reinforce that? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am. Delight yourself in Jesus Christ. The I am. And in doing so, Fear evaporates. 
If Abram's story is a case study of what not to do, then Psalm 37 is an account of what to do. Because in both cases, there was a problem and there was a fear. And in the case of Psalm 37, and this is not David who wrote this, I don't think. But, um, but it begins by saying in verse 1, Fret not yourself because of evildoers, but rather delight in the Lord. The problem in, in Psalm 37 was the psalmist was just torn apart by the injustice and the unfairness of life. And it affected him and it affected his nation. And it was just eating him up inside as he looked around him and said, this is just not right. And he began to fret and to stew and to become obsessed about the unfairness of it all. And, and it's just like his whole soul shouted and said, who's going to fix this? And he began to think about it, think about it, and think about it. Do you, do you ever get to there where you're obsessed about the unfairness of life? And what's going on either in your personal world or in, in the world of those around you or our own, our own nation or the globe? I mean, we look at the injustice and we see where strong men are destroying the lives of others. And we're saying, this is wrong. Who's going to fix this? And, and we see it in the news. And then we see how they just sit in their castles and they enjoy the spoils of their victims. And it eats us up inside because, and it may be personal wrongs that have been done against you, betrayal, lies, and we fret and we think about it. And we can either become obsessed over the unfairness of it all, and, or we can do what the psalmist did and that he, he, he discovered God is not asleep here. He's watching. He's taking notes. And the Psalm 37, as you go through the whole Psalm, you realize nobody's getting away with anything here. God is the one who's ruling over it all. Verses 34 and 39, for instance, the psalmist said, Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will watch when the wicked are destroyed. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord their refuge in a time of distress. So we wait for the Lord in our, in our times of fear, and we choose to delight in him. And when we delight in him, we trust in the Lord, we do what is good, we commit our way to the Lord. All of these things are found in that psalm. And one day our righteousness will shine like the dawn. Now this is not just poetic language. This is actually a way of life. And it produces a very healthy mental attitude. It frees us up from worry and anxiety and being obsessed over things that we can't fix. I can't change this. Well, I can either think about it, think about it, think about it, and just have an ulcer over it. Or I say, you know what? I can't fix it. But I'm going to choose to put my focus on my covenant-keeping Lord. And I'm going to delight in him. To delight in the Lord means to enjoy him. Enjoy and, and find the affections of our heart drawn to him. And the ambitions of our life revolve around him. I live for him. I set my mind on him. And I'm fully engaged to learn about my God, my covenant-keeping God, and make that my goal in 2023. So let the Lord and his majesty and all of the wonderful things and, and the magnificent works, let those capture your mind and delight in him to enjoy the Lord. It was, Tom, it was Puritan uh, Thomas Watson who said that God is a satisfying good. He made the point of saying that if there's enough in God to satisfy the angels, then surely... There's enough to satisfy us. And he is a very satisfying God. Watson goes on to say that God is a delicious good. Great way of saying it. 
That is, if you're empty inside, then you need to feed on something that is delicious and satisfying. And that's the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and enjoy him. And there are times where the best thing that we can do is to put away your device and the internet and your hobbies and your agenda and just open your Bible and just enjoy it, feed upon it, be satisfied with it and get to know your God and linger in his presence. Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and opens the door, I come in and will linger in a meal with him and he with me. Well, what's I talking about? Delighting in Jesus, having a really good time and enjoying his company and his presence. Now, I personally have been putting into practice what I recommended to you some weeks ago and that I've been working my way through the book of Exodus. And I've been reading this and it is delicious. It's very satisfying because in that book I see our great and majestic Lord, the covenant-keeping God. And in this book we see all of these displayed and it's full of delight. The one remedy to sinful fear that is guaranteed to work is to delight in the Lord. It puts everything in its proper perspective. It's what the disciples learned, because when you see them in the book of Acts, they're totally different. It's like they finally get it. And with the power of the Holy Spirit helping them, you see Peter, right? He's there the next day. He's supposed to be executed. He's in prison, but what's he doing? Is he fretting? Is he biting his fingernails? No, he's asleep. So sound asleep that the angel came and he had to really take a whack at him to wake him up because he was so sound asleep. He was, he was not bothered. And, and, and yet his, his life was on the line. So isn't it, isn't it great when we delight ourselves in the Lord, everything begins to take its proper perspective. We begin to realize, you know, I'm a child of God. He predestined me to be made into the image of Christ, to be reformed. And so I have been called by him. I have been uh, justified and I am being glorified. It's all there. So what do we say to these things, asks Romans 8. If God is for us, who is against us? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Are you troubled by fear today? Are you afraid of the unknown? Are you afraid of people? Are you afraid of failure? Are you afraid of Satan? Are you afraid of death? Delight yourself in Jesus Christ. He gave his, his life's blood to save you. And, and as we see in Romans 8, it says if, if God would give you that gift, then he'll give you everything else you need because that's the best he's got. Everything else kind of comes below that. He'll take care of you. Do not worry. Do not fret. Don't worry about the unknown or, or become fretful over people. And the depth of, of God's love for you is endless. And that's what we keep our minds settled on. Let's go before him in prayer. Our Lord and our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that when we do reflect upon that relationship we have with you, it does put everything back in its proper place. As, as a father, you're not going to allow anything to happen to us that is apart from your permission. Nothing can touch us apart from you allowing that to happen. We are indeed the pupil of your eye. And we love that. And it reassures us that nothing 
that, in, that we encounter is something that should alarm and cause us to become paralyzed with sinful fear. So we commit once again that which has been um, uh, perhaps keeping us awake at night, that which has become an obsession to us. We, we give it over to you right now at the close of this service. And we pray that you would enable us to learn how to delight in you and to enjoy you and to discover how satisfying and delicious is that relationship with you. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.